Hello, and welcome to Creative Banter, a creativity and philosophy-focused podcast where anything goes. I'm your host, Cody Schultz. Joining me is the one and only Ben Horn. Over on the Discord server, we recently had a photographer beg the question whether photography is considered an art or a craft, which led to quite an interesting discussion, though no solid answer may ever be etched in stone. After rambling on a bit, we found ourselves talking about electric vehicles and what the future may hold. Let's dive right into it, shall we? So over on the Discord, we have another topic suggestion from a photographer. Ooh, what is it this time? So I can't pronounce it. I'm not even going to try his last name because I'm not going to make a fool of myself. But uh, Jay posted, is photography a craft or an art? Or when does something, i.e. photography, become an art? So he goes on to give an example. Painting is widely considered an art. But if you give me a paintbrush, paint, and a blank canvas, you're not going to get art. Though I can paint a mean fence, but that is more of a craft side. <laughs> so, yeah. So, what are your thoughts on photography as a craft versus an art? It definitely has aspects of both. Um, and I was thinking about something that could be quite similar in a way, perhaps a comparison, which is maybe the playing of a musical instrument um, where there's there's a certain technical skill involved, but then there's some people that rise above that where it excels more into the art category. So, I mean, I, I can see that. And, and that's always a comparison I've made when it comes to, to, to cameras in general, is that they're a bit more like instruments in a way. Um, but that's it, it's a very it's a tough question, isn't it? Yeah, it is. I mean, I could go either way with it, but it's it gets into a very, I guess, dark category wherein you have to try and define what a craft is, and then try and define what art is, and trying to find art is a whole. I mean. You could spend hours trying to figure that one out. I mean, I wrote an article yeah. for on landscape a while back and kind of diving into what is art. And I, I was almost forced to look at commercial art versus fine art, or so to speak, because hmm. even within that, you have to... There are different determinations and little nuances and nobody no one's going to agree what art is i mean you yeah. can look at um like interpretive dance and you say well that's an art but then you can look at ballet and say well that's not an art uh, you can go so many different ways with the definitions of art and it's going to be so subjective because not everyone's going to agree whether a video game should be considered art or whether it should be considered a craft or something in between so you you end up treading in really murky water there so how would you define a craft whenever i think of a craft i think of like the typical craft shows that you can go to where they have like the clocks made with that they paint over um like vinyl records and they have the drip paint over that and a craft more so like a um i guess where the end result is utilitarian where it's something that yeah. you can actually use and in your daily life whereas i guess then if you're making an making art it's more something that is a luxury product that is going to be uh enjoyed on a more psychological rather than tangible level if that makes any sense. Yeah. I mean, for, for me, and again, with art, it's, it's, it's a tricky thing for me. 
art oftentimes, not always, but oftentimes it has some sort of sense of expression to it. A craft for me, I see it as fulfilling a somehow, purpose. Yeah, doing something for the sake of doing something like you have you're not necessarily trying to express but there it's tricky because you know there's a very there's a significant overlap between them um a craft it seems like it's the both craft and art they both take skills to do um almost it seems to me like crafts feel a little bit more formulaic perhaps like more touching on the technical side of, of things like when it comes to photography, the, the craft behind it, the, the technical aspects behind it, which is a foundation for the art side of things. But that being said, you know, some of the, it's a tricky one. It really is. is it, <laughs> that's a very good question. Yeah. I mean, if I'm going to really settle on anything and my mind's always going to be changed about it, but I do like that idea or that distinction between a craft where it's, you are making something for a specific purpose for a specific use. Whereas art, you are making more for the expressional aspects of it. Cause I think that kind of covers art in general, like whether it's, dance whether it's music or photography painting etc that, that's yeah. about as close to a definition as i could possibly get between the two which then goes into whether the, to the main question of whether photography is a craft or an art i mean it's both i think it depends on your purpose or your the what, what yeah. you plan on doing with it like if you so yeah. in in the article that I did, and I'll put a link down below for it, um, I talked about the commercial versus the um, the fine art aspect of of it, and specifically, I was talking a little bit about um, like Andy Warhol and his use with the. Uh, the Campbell's soup as that. That was one of my examples there. Let me see if I can pull up this article mm -hmm. so I can better reference it. Um, so, okay, it was commercial art versus personal art. So I said that commercial art can be classified as an art that is created for the purpose of advertising or selling a product. One such example of this categorization is that of Andy Warhol and his famous Campbell's Soup artwork, a piece containing four differently colored Campbell's Soup cans in a squared arrangement. While at initial view, this piece seems to be personal art, and though one cannot guess Warhol's goals, it does not take long before the implied intentions of this piece are revealed. As commentary on advertising, the idea is to get the viewer to purchase the product being shown. After having viewed Warhol's piece, the audience is more likely to start heading home thinking of Campbell's Soup, possibly going so far as to stop at the store to purchase a few cans. This is at the, f at the end of, uh, this is at the commercial end of art, advertising disguised through the vein of art. I go on to say, personal art is crafted by the artist with a view through their soul, imbuing their artwork with meaning and emotion, of which only the artist may understand or get. Think of the work crafted by Edward Weston, particularly his series of pepper photographs. While many viewers have witnessed within these fine pieces an underlying dimension of sexual energy, which makes sense given his primary subject matter being that of naked women, West Weston himself had vehemently denied such a thing. The meaning he imbued in his art was different than the meaning his audience found within the pieces. So... All that to go along, I'd place, if you're going to be doing a commercial art or commercial photography, as more of the craft side, because there's specifically a 
a, a use sides a use side to it yeah. you're using it for advertising for a specific purpose to get someone to do something whereas with photography as a personal art a means of expression it is simply that a means of imbuing artwork with meaning and emotion of which like i say only the artist may understand or get so i think that's as succinct of an answer as i could possibly give to that question but even still like scrolling through this article that i'd written over a year ago now it's a lot has changed about my opinion on it and a lot will continue yeah. to change and i think that is the biggest thing no one's going to be able to agree on one side or the other and there, there's another thing that i've been fascinated by which is something we've touched on in past episodes which is the perception of our own work with time and within that context I was thinking about at the moment when we're in the field, when we are creating the image, what is going to be the stronger influence? The craft side of things, the art side of things, and then how that changes with time. Because, I mean, when, when working with, with film and with large format, there's a lot to be said about the craft side of things as you're actually working with the camera and the entire process that is involved in taking a photo. And for me, at that point in time, the art side of thing is just something just kind of in the back of my mind. It's not as much in the forefront of my mind. It's typically that there is this beautiful scene that grabbed my attention for some reason, which I might not be completely aware of at that point in time. But at that point, it really is just the, the technical craft side of it to try and capture it as best as I can. But then with the passage of time, when that craft side is kind of long gone in the past, now at a certain point, it's going through all the photos from the trip and then perhaps trying to extract whatever it was that that feeling I had in the field, which maybe I couldn't quite figure out what it was at that point in time. But after living with that image for a while, I feel like that's when a bit more of the art side tends to emerge a little bit more because I, I start to become more aware of perhaps why it was I was drawn to that subject or maybe there's other elements within that scene that I was completely oblivious to at the moment. But in retrospect, looking at that image, it all kind of seems to fit together a little bit more and to make a bit more sense. So I could see it as also perhaps a bit of an evolving process that leads to art, but may not necessarily be the primary motivation behind it for the entire experience. You could even say that the end goal, if your end goal is for prints of your work, that that is where the the craft side of things come into it. Yeah, it ties in again, as you're saying, because it's at that point you're you're creating something, whether it's the print, you're creating something, whether it's that original sheet of film that's being exposed. Um, just as you were saying earlier about kind of like the utilitarian kind of side of things, so it, it's it seems like it's kind of an evolving process in a way. Definitely an interesting discussion. Uh, there's yeah. there's so much more that could be delved into it depending on how far you want to take it i mean and depending on who you ask you're always going to get a different a different perception on it yeah so that's what makes it tricky and fun yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> a, very, a very good question regardless and i i don't know if we came up with an answer other than just uh babbling on for 15 know, minutes talking it through yeah <laughs> so a little bit in line here i sent out my uh, a morning walk ebook to get printed because i wanted to see oh, cool. whether it would turn out all right as a printed form and i got it back uh -huh. uh, 
after I got back from the, the cabin yesterday. It was sitting here waiting for me. And I gotta say, I'm just not that happy with it. How so? So I used Blurb to print it. And I was, I was going back and forth depending on who I wanted to use and all of that. And it don't get me wrong, it's cool to see this and have this as a tangible product. But you start flipping through it and obviously, yeah, there are some things that would need to be changed like font size and uh, all of that. But that notwithstanding, how the images were printed just is... It doesn't do it justice. Yeah. Like there's... It would be fine, but the biggest aspect is, like, you flip through some of these, and there are chunks, like, penny-sized chunks of ink missing from some of these images. Just like that, it, it the ink wasn't dried fully, and they closed up the book or bound oh. it, and then, because of opening it or whatever, it just tore away the ink. Yeah, that's not good. So I'm <laughs> like, I good. cannot justify selling this for even $20, $30, whatever, and then have someone open it up and be like, oh, and have the same yeah. reaction that I did when I opened it. So I'm kind of... And especially if it's print-on-demand where you don't get a chance to see it and flip through it before well, I mean, even it's sent to the person. Yeah, even so. I mean, like, even if I would do... Because ideally I would do pre-orders and say I would get 50 pre-orders. That would be my addition that's a lot of books to look through and then you yeah. got to worry about it cutting into your profits if five of those books even aren't up to par so now what you order another five which is more expensive than ordering the 50 and you get into a bunch of different difficulties there too because those five that you get back three of those could be fine but then two aren't so now you're constantly playing a game because you don't have any kind yeah. of quality control. It's a shame because it was something that I was really looking forward to to offering. But the more that I think about it, I just can't justify offering a product that isn't going to be high quality for any kind of price. Because yeah. I know that if I would get it, if I would purchase something that like that from you or from really anyone spending $30 on it, say... I'd open that up and see the quality that I saw and I'd be like, really? Like, this is acceptable to you? Yeah. Yeah, that's 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 definitely uh, a disappointment to hear the how that one turned out. Um, I have seen some of the zines from Blurb in the past and, and the ones I saw were fine, but clearly they're having an issue with, uh, with yours, with for whatever reason, the, the ink not sticking to the, the paper as it should. Um, I recently um, reached out to a friend of mine who does zines and asked him who he uses to produce them. And he told me that he was using Smart Press. And so I, I ordered a, um, a little uh, paper sampler pack from them, and it has a whole variety of different papers. And um, I was pretty impressed with what I saw from the variety of papers and there are some images printed on them so you can see how the images look on there um, at this point that's probably who i'm going to go with for the um for the the zine that i want to come up with in a little over a year so uh all the work from uh 2023 would go into that one and they have a variety of different formats and they're pretty adaptable and all that. Um, but it's also a sort of thing where you have to order them in a quantity as opposed to them being shipped directly to the customer. So I'd have an opportunity to flip through them. Um, but yeah, that, that's definitely a very, very much a disappointment to hear your experience with the ones from blurb. Um, yeah. That's that's what was it happening on like the darkest parts of the images? No, that's what was surprising. Like I have some that that's are uh, lighter images, like literally of the of the sky, and it's just like a pale gray almost, and it's just ripped right out. So I'm not I'm not quite sure what what was going on there. Um, 
Yeah, it almost sounds like there's, a, in, like if a person was trying to like paint, for example, like paint a wall or whatever, and there's like some oil on the wall, just paint won't even stick to it. It almost makes you wonder if there's some weird batch of paper or something, but yeah, definitely, definitely something to, to reach out to them about, say, Hey, what's, what's going on with this? That's, Cause that's definitely not a good first taste of, uh, of a product of doing yeah. that. I mean, I'm looking at smart press now and the, the other unfortunate thing too is just how expensive it is to do a zine. Yeah. I mean, I, you have to do a lot of them for it to, um, for it to pay off. Yeah. I mean, like, a total quantity of 80 or of 50 rather with 80 pages in an eight by eight size. You're looking at almost $800. Yeah. Though I, I, I have a feeling that the number of, so I was, I was pricing them out and I was trying to figure out the size. And this is something that perhaps uh, maybe some of the people listening could, could chime in on. I was thinking about doing a square format that way, when I have the, uh, you know, the the film on one page, whether it's horizontal or vertical, it's going to display nicely either way. And then the facing page would have my written journal for that particular day I took the photo. But I've been trying to decide what size to go, and they have an option for an eight by eight. But I feel like that'd be almost a bit too small. And you can do custom sizes. You could do you know nine by nine, ten by ten, other sizes as well. So perhaps throwing this one out to those listening and maybe you can chime in on, on the discord. Uh, if you guys have any thoughts on the size of it and I'm just kind of curious what people, um, have in mind when it comes to that. And, and that could be something that'd be beneficial maybe for you too, as well, Cody, um, trying to figure out like what size to go, if you go that route and, and they are, they can definitely be a bit expensive to produce. I think. Uh, I was looking at doing it with all recycled paper and which makes it a little bit more money, but I think it would be just a nice, um, a nice touch to them. But I think it was coming out to like, you know, seven bucks each or it was somewhere in about that range for the size and the quantity of, uh, pages and stuff that I, that I had entered in there. Yeah. I mean, it, it works itself out to like 10, 15 bucks each or so how I had it set up, but Mm -hmm. Speaking on size, I the one that I had gotten back was an eight by ten, and to be honest, it felt a little big for a zine. Okay, I think an eight by eight would be, I think okay. Yeah, but personally, I wouldn't go much bigger than what an eight by ten is. I I would personally lean a little bit smaller than that because I don't. There's there's something about. Like at eight by ten, I'd much rather have a full, a nicely produced coffee table book at that size. That's it true. It feels more substantial. It doesn't have as much of a bend as what an eight by ten zine is, especially if it's not a hardcover product. Um, it just it felt a little bit too big. Like if I was gonna have another one printed from another company or however. I would definitely go a little bit smaller, more towards like the six by nine size or so. Um, yeah. But I am curious to hear what other people think about that. Yeah. Cause it, it's also weighing in the experience of seeing, cause for mine, I'm going to have the image, uh, which would display fine smaller as well, but, but also to have the written text. So I want to make sure that it stays nice and legible, um, but I'll have to do some mock-ups um, that's one of the things I definitely learned when I was doing some design courses back in the day. Just you, you, you can tell a lot by just seeing something physically and doing a little bit of a mock-up to see how it, how it handles it and how everything works out. Um, but, but yeah, I, th I think also, you know, the, the experience you had with the one from blurb, it's perhaps just part of the, uh, just it, it in, in some ways, sometimes something like that is good to have that experience right away so that you know more so what to look for as opposed to, you know, having that all going on behind your back and not even knowing that there was a problem to begin with. Yeah. Uh, if you're, you know, mailing out customer orders and such. Yeah. As a whole, I think this project is going to stick as, a, as an ebook for now. 
maybe down the line I'll find a way to bring it into a tangible form but uh, right now I just don't have the, the time or the means to really play with producing it tangibly as I'd like to I mean if I had more time on my hands I would consider making the book myself and doing all the stitching and just as a very oh it's a lot of work yeah it, it would be amazing <laughs> to do though as but yeah. then like i was thinking about it though well then all of a sudden you you're charging 75 bucks each for a very small edition because of the amount of work that goes into it yeah. even for a small thing and then that there's a lot to think about with it but i mean yeah it's uh interesting <laughs> Yeah, I'm I'm looking forward to seeing how that project evolves um, for me in 2023. Um, just because there's something very satisfying when a project like that starts to take shape, where you don't quite fully know how it's going to be when you're first starting out with it. There's there's a concept behind it, but not really knowing where it's going to take me. And I think it'll be quite fun laying it out and having that part of the creative process. Um, and also I think for, for me at least with doing the written journal entries in the field, I think that'll help me a lot when I go on the trips as well. So I, I think I, I see it as being something beneficial um, just so long as you know, <laughs> once it's all said and done that the, uh, you know, the print quality is, is decent enough and everything translates pretty well. But I, I do look forward to that taking shape. And then I also do plan on doing a, um, an ebook version of, of that one as well, since it'll be designed the same way. I think that'll be something, something kind of neat to look forward to next year is just changing things up a little bit. Yeah. Do you know what uh, edition size you plan on doing with that? Or aren't you sure yet? So I, um, it'll probably be at least a hundred. I plan on uh, releasing a a tier on my Patreon where people will receive the zine as part of that tier, along with the other stuff below that. Um, in terms of like the thank you note and all that, so I plan on having that as one of the tiers on Patreon. Um. But I think that will give me a little taste in terms of the demand. But then all the other ones that are available beyond that would just be for sale on my on my website. Um, so I think it just kind of depends on as the project starts taking shape. And also, I think it'll be, I think it'll tie in kind of nicely for when I am in the field, maybe like on a backpacking trip, it'll just be, maybe there'll be a little clip here and there where as I'm sitting there like writing in the journal, you kind of see the first little bit of it or whatever. But it'll just be kind of neat that that will show up in the zine later on to get the full sense of, of everything. But it'll probably be at least 100 because I think that's like the minimum order for smart press. Gotcha. Yeah. That also makes it a lot cheaper on your end too as a per unit basis at least. Yeah. So. Yeah. It keeps it it keeps it keeps reasonable. Yeah. But it, and if that's something that works out, then I can see that definitely being a – something I do yearly. Um, but, uh, I guess, I guess we'll see how it all works out. Yeah. Like we were talking about last week, that discovery of place journal has me a lot more excited than what any kind of individual zine does right now. Yeah. I was talking to my girlfriend a little bit about it last night when she came over and I was explaining the, the idea to her and just trying to figure out, okay, if I do this for, say, Acadia, I want to go twice a year, like do a spring and a fall trip, mm -hmm. and have a, a true, finely produced book made, like after five years, so after like 10 trips or whatever it is, instead yeah. of doing it as like a zine or anything, just have it as a long-term project where even if that book is just for me, to have something that is a high quality production made, I think would be really satisfying on like a, on a personal basis. Yeah. So that's got me very excited and I'm 
got to figure out the logistics of all of that and all that fun stuff as it comes around. Probably do my first yeah. trip sometime next year, whether it's a spring trip or more likely maybe a fall trip. I don't know exactly what I all have planned with trips next year yet, but yeah, ho- hopefully you'll have better luck next year than you than you did this year. Yeah, hopefully. <laughs> how how many trips has it been that you've been on this year? Not many. Most of it's been up to the mountains. Yeah. Um, we've gone up to the mountains three or four times with the bikes. And then I had a trip down to the beach with my girlfriend's family. And then before that was uh, the Smokies. And then before that was the small uh, overnight trip. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, a, a decent amount, but not a not a ton of like going to Acadia or like big places like that, so to speak, more yeah. like localized stuff. But you also have a, a very, very uh, busy and uh, hectic schedule. Yes, so definitely. <laughs> I, I think you are, you're uh, a, a, above average when it comes to getting out there considering, you know, everything else that you have going on. So. Yeah, I'm planning on going for a hike for the first time in far too long this Saturday just oh, to cool. a local spot that I love to visit and uh, that'll be nice to just get out again because it, yeah. it's been a couple of months since I've actually gone on a nice decent day long hike so well, that's cool yeah on uh, on Sunday um, is when I'm heading to Zion so we're recording this kind of like mid October and um, and I for the past couple of days now I've just been getting everything uh, ready to go on that trip and I just have I have this six foot folding table set up in my home office and I just have my my bag with my video kit in there I have a another bag that has just all the backup gear redundant gear all the sort of stuff that you learn to take with you through the years I have another bag that has my large format lenses and I got the cameras I'm just going through the process of getting all the batteries charged up and everything organized for the video kit. And then also going through all the, uh, the large format stuff I'll need to probably load film maybe tomorrow or so, but it just, it, it is, it's almost absurd how much stuff I have to bring on these trips to do something that I think when people watch the videos, seems very casual and seems very effortless but you don't really see everything else that that goes into it in terms of just everything that is necessary um but i'm really looking forward to the trip this year i i i had some um uh, i've seen some some pictures of zion taking the past couple of days from some people that have been through there and uh, it's just it's it's really neat to see the the leaves starting to change colors, and uh, I'll be getting there a little bit ahead of the fall color, which will be which will be nice. But I'm I, I think this might be the year that I finally am able to catch a mountain lion on my game cam. Um, so we will we will see. That's, that's speaking of long term projects. That's been it's been one of mine. Hopefully, it's just um, on your game cam and not in your visual perception to be quite yeah uh, yeah scary. i i could i could do without uh without an encounter in the, in the field but man i i whenever i go there i always see their tracks uh from overnight and it's it's truly fascinating that there are these you know very large cats that live there that no one ever really sees um but i'm, I'm definitely looking forward to that and then also there's there's a core group of photographers that I run into each year at Zion. So I always look forward to, you know, seeing people around in the various canyons and uh, back at camp and, and stuff along those lines. Um, so it'll, it'll be interesting. I'll be doing the, the journal entries, the, the handwritten journal entries on this trip, even though uh, they won't necessarily be part of the zine project. But I think it's just for my own, like, like mental health in the field, <laughs> just uh force me to to relax and to to calm down a little bit in terms of because there's there's a lot of pressure involved 
when going on the trips. And so to try to try to minimize that uh, a little bit. Um, you plan on bringing any black and white film with you or no? I do. Uh, I, I do plan on bringing some black and white. There is perfect time for some it really beautiful color. trees. <laughs> it, yeah, there's. Well, I, I have a I bought a yellow filter and a red filter. Okay, cool. um, there's this one really cool box elder tree that lives in this canyon. It sounds like I'm talking about it like it's an animal <laughs> here. It lives in a canyon. Uh, it's growing in in this uh, narrow slot canyon, and I've photographed it in years past. But the light is never very ideal for it. Uh, when photographing it in color because it's just very bluish light down there it's not very dimensional light but the tree often has these brilliant yellow leaves on it so I'm thinking that might be a very good candidate for black and white Um, if I can create some separation between that and the background because it's got these really gnarly roots and it's it's a really cool looking tree so I do think I will do some black and white um, I, I still have yet to develop the black and white uh, film from the trip I took up to the White Mountains in August. Uh, so I can just do all those in, in, one, in one batch without having to get everything set up, you know, multiple times and all that sort of setup. So I, a little like tidbit, perhaps, uh-huh. whenever I'm using a color filter, especially like I've, I've grown to get used to a red filter pretty well, but... Mm -hmm. Since you're not used to it as much, I would highly recommend for this box elder tree, so say, uh, to use the yellow filter and then try it without taking... That was my goal. Just so that you get an idea of how that scene and those colors in particular are going to react to using such a filter versus using the the film that you're using. Because what film are you you playing with now? Uh, I have Ilford, oh, I think it's, is it, oh, Delta, Delta 100 is well. Okay. Yeah. So it's, it's a relatively slow film. So, I mean, for me, the red filter is kind of like reserve that for bright sunlight since that kills three stops of light. Um, the yellow filter, I think was only like a stop or something. Yeah. It should, it was should be somewhere range. around that. Uh, yeah. No, but that should look, that should look pretty good with those yellow leaves and a yellow filter that'll really brighten the hell out of them yeah so i i I think that'll be a a fun experience doing that um and there was something that i wrote about in the ebook i released a little while back which was i i enjoy the process of leaving subjects behind for future trips and so on this trip there's several scenes that um caught my eye in the past that I know when the light is pretty good on them. And so that'll keep me busy for the first few days. Um, there's this one where there was these rocks that had tumbled down from a, uh, kind of down into like the sandstone valley is the best way I can describe it. It doesn't really look like a canyon. It looks a bit more like a valley, but just a smaller scale. But there are these really cool looking rocks down there that I want to try to photograph, um, at a particular time of day when the light's pretty good. And there's some other scenes as well. So it's just, it's just like visiting old friends, going there and uh, checking up on some of the scenes, seeing how they've changed. And um, so that, I think that's going to be a pretty, pretty fun trip. And I'll, I'll see how long I could stay in the field. Usually it's, usually it's about 10 days or so. Yeah. I'm looking forward to seeing what you come back with, especially when it comes to the black and white side of things should be yeah. interesting how you how your perception changes between using color versus monochrome yeah yeah i think it'll be interesting for sure just it'll give a whole different thought process Definitely. and maybe open up some more subjects that i hadn't really considered in the past because they just weren't as ideally suited for for photographing in color Sorry, by the time, because this is the 25th episode, so by the time we get to the 50th episode, you're going to be all black and white, saving so much money. (laughs) Just (laughs) getting there a little bit at a time. A little bit by a little bit. It's going to be great. Yeah. So I've also had some other uh, thoughts in the past uh, few days or so 
when I went on the trip up to the Eastern Sierra, and I was just yeah, getting to know the place and all that sort of stuff, um, I I had noticed that they had a, a Rivian charging station in, in Bishop, California, right you know right at the gateway to the Eastern Sierra, and I'm like, oh wow, that's pretty cool. I wonder how big their their charging network is, and it turns out there's like four of them right now. That just <laughs> happens to be one of them. So not, not as widespread, but I started going down the rabbit hole in terms of what the possibility will be for going with an electric vehicle for my next vehicle when the time comes, which is the next several years. And I gotta say, other than them being very expensive, it's very exciting what's on the way. I don't know if, have you been doing any look at electric vehicles or anything in terms of what's coming out or anything along those lines? Besides Elon Musk being in the news about Russia and Ukraine and all of that fun stuff. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, not really. It, it, it's a matter of I'm not in the market for a new vehicle at any point in the future. Like, yeah, that I can foresee. Um, so I don't really keep a big eye on it. I'm, I'm on Rivian's site right now, though, and the, what is it, the R1S? Yeah, that's what I'm yeah, looking at. Yeah, that is insanely expensive. That they is are. just ridiculous. And, and so here's the thing. Here in California, they're going to make it so in 2035, I believe, um, you won't be able to buy a new uh, gas-powered vehicle. It's, it's going to be all electric or um i mean hydrogen would also be a good way to go but then there isn't the infrastructure for that yet um and i i usually keep my vehicles for 10 years so before having my my forerunners are 2014 before that i had a 2004 and so i'm looking at 2024 coming up and i'm thinking you know even though the electric isn't quite there yet for all the trips i go on it seems like there are so many changes being made very quickly now that it feels like that's going to be a good way to go. And I started crunching the numbers on things a little bit. And so with my forerunner, I spend probably about $3,700 a year on gas, uh, give or take. That's assuming I drive about 10,000 miles. Um, over the life of that car, that's $37,000 on gas. And so you start doing the math on some of that stuff and then you don't have the maintenance costs as much. And it is insane what the Rivians cost, but it's also one of those things where it's like looking at like an Arca Swiss eight by 10 camera, or it's like looking at a Chamonix eight by 10 camera or on its face value. It just seems absolutely insane how expensive it is, especially for something as simple as, you know, the cameras are. But the longer you look at it, the more you start to justify it, and that starts getting a little bit scary. See, my biggest issue with Rivian or any of them right now is just the lack of infrastructure. And and to yeah. think that... So my neighbor is dating a guy that uh, has a Tesla, and they went, up to, mm -hmm. they went up to Acadia for, I think it was like a year ago or so, um, but just getting up there and because you don't have as much of an infrastructure for electric charging and all of that as you do even now compared to last year, but especially because of yeah. being on the East Coast, the fact that you have to sit there and wait a half hour to an hour for a full charge, that's a huge turnoff after only driving 260 to 300 miles or so, whatever it is. Yeah. So, I mean, but see, I, I, I think that infrastructure is going to build up very quickly. And I, I even, um, someone had mentioned to me that, um, at some point here, there's talk that perhaps Tesla might open up their network of superchargers to other vehicles as well. And I'm, I don't know how much of that is rumor versus fact, but I, I think once they start flipping the switch, I think the transition is going to happen a lot faster than people think. At, at this point, I could do trips to the Eastern Sierra and would be fine. Um, there's not really any charging stations 
um, within Rivian's network in Utah yet, though if Tesla opens up theirs, then that would work out pretty well. But I think within the next several years, which is when I'm due for a new vehicle, I honestly think that the infrastructure is going to be at the point where it will be perfectly doable. And I got to say that that's, it's pretty exciting, but also expensive. But it's, I, I think we're going to see these changes happen very, very fast. My biggest issue when it comes to like the, the charging networks and the infrastructure of it, though, is if you're relying on Tesla to open up theirs or these small like mm-hmm. Rivian to open up theirs to everybody else, look at what Musk is doing right now with Starlink completely shut it down in Ukraine because yeah. he doesn't agree with the war. Like you give you give one person that much power over an entire infrastructure, you're screwed. You 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 irritate yeah, the, him for the, one over one thing and it just becomes this little a child throwing a tantrum and destroying yeah. everything. I mean, yeah, you can always you're you're going to have to have the government involved in some way to to ensure that that's not going to happen. But there's pros and cons regardless how you look at it. I mean, it, it's going yeah. to be... Though in the case of the, the, like the charging stations, that's an area where it doesn't take a person to innovate that quite as much. It's just a matter of once there's more demand for it, I think you're going to see a lot more of the sort of independent type stations uh, start to pop up. Um, whereas it's not something that's necessarily controlled by, you know, just one person, whether it's Rivian or Tesla. I mean, I can see there being other, you know, many years from now, just whatever brand it is, will have their charging stations and kind of built around some sort of experience. And, and the thought of, of charging up, you know, sitting there for an hour or whatever, yeah, a little bit of a drag when you kind of get up early, you're on the road. But at the same time, if I'm just sitting there and there's good Wi-Fi and there's a good cell signal, we all know that you just doom scroll for an hour and then yeah, <laughs> and then you'll be good. And, and the reality to rebuttal that is, first of all, if you're driving to a location like for you to Zion or for me to Acadia, you know it's going to be a long road. So you're going to be yeah. planning in specific breaks. You will plan in charging breaks. And for everybody else who has an electric vehicle, you get a, what do they consider it for Tesla? A stage two charger in your house. So yeah. you just plug it in every night. You wake up and you have a full tank every morning before you go out. Kind of nice, huh? It definitely does sound nice, yeah. It's just going to be very interesting and a little scary to be honest with how things are going to progress just because it's one of those transitional periods that at least for me is the one of the first transitional periods that's big in my lifetime that's it could go either way it you don't know how it's going to turn out and i hope for the best i hope that for you guys in california that 20 35 or so comes along and the infrastructure is there and everything is a resounding success. But at the same time, you have to look at the other side of things and for every other state, like say Texas or even Pennsylvania, are they going to be on board as quick and be able to get that kind of infrastructure? I'm pretty sure. Yeah. And I'm pretty sure that Texas by 2035, I think, I think I heard that they're going to mandate uh, rolling coal as the <laughs> like you 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 have to roll coal. There's no way around it. Uh, that would know? not surprise me. But but I also look at like so for California, pretty much the entire state is pretty populated. When you compare it to a state like Wyoming or Montana, yeah, that's going to be tough trying to put in that kind of infrastructure especially in places where you only have a very small population of a couple people throughout that entire state. There, there's going to be a lot of uh, 
a lot of people that just don't want to deal with it and don't want that change. People don't like change. Yeah. That's yeah. just what it comes down to. And and I also I think that when there's there's a strong resistance to change and I'm I'm on I mean I'm I'm in the camp as well. I I, I appreciate sameness. Um but at the same time some change I think in light of what's happening in the world it it at least you know that the reasoning behind it is is for the best as opposed to something that you're just being told you have to do but it's you know I, I I think I think it's a it'll be a something that we look back on many many years from now that you know people used to drive cars that would burn you know uh, fossil fuels you know it'll just it'll be looked at as kind of a, a a strangely archaic way of doing things yeah i mean the the other issue that you have to keep in mind too is and this is often brought up by like my dad specifically him and i will talk politics and we're typically on we are agreeable on some things but we're on two different sides of the spectrum for a lot of things and Mm-hmm. One of the points that he brought up, which always makes me think, is, well, where is this electricity coming from? Ultimately, it's coming from burning coal. It's still, or from burning fossil fuels or the like. You're still, and it, the more people that are relying on electricity, the more uh, that you have to burn to meet that demand. And yes, we still have uh, solar power and wind turbines and or windmills whatever that all of that but that infrastructure isn't as stable as what coal is going to be or is going to continue to be for a while so it's which is true but also it's at least here in california we're seeing more and more and more of our energy coming from um from things other than fossil fuels so that's something where it continues to get cleaner with time. Um, and so that's that's something where, it, for the time being, yes. But also, it's, 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 it's a resource that can continue to grow um, through a variety of different ways. And there's, there's thankfully a lot of uh, smart people out there that are figuring that sort of stuff out. But it's, like you said, it's a transitional period. And it's not going to be as though we flip a switch and immediately go to the new thing. There's going to be all kinds of things to work out along the way. Yeah. But I definitely think it's very, very exciting to see what's coming down the line. It definitely is. Yeah. And I'm not trying to play devil's advocate here and say that I'm not excited for what's coming up. It's just, it's also something to keep in mind. The fact that California in terms of progressiveness is a decade or so, if not further ahead than what, most other states in this country unfortunately are so yeah. that's looking at the reality of it it's going to be a it's a long haul it's a long-term goal to get to that point and there's going to be a lot of resistance yeah. and a lot of bumps in the road but yeah it's going to be interesting but just just imagine this off-road somewhere driving on some rough road out there just quiet just the sound of your tires on the on the uh, crunching the the rocks on the ground, but just quiet. I hope you enjoyed our creative banter. You can learn more about Cody's work by visiting his website, CodySchultz.com. And you can find my work at benhorn.com. For further discussion, join us at patreon.com slash creative banter. It's a place where we can interact with you, the listener. And although we greatly appreciate those who contribute by joining a tier, discussions are open to everyone, whether you're a paying member or not. Thanks so much for listening, and we'll see you around next time.